Welcome to KJV Cafe. Thanks for taking time out of your day to listen. Each episode of the cafe is dedicated to studying the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Your host here at the cafe is Bible teacher Clark Covington. Looks like the coffee is hot and ready, so let's get started. Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe. Pastor Clark Covington here with another episode of KJV Cafe. I'm so glad you're here. Praise the Lord. It is a wonderful day here at the cafe. I'm so excited to be here as we dive deeper into God's word. And we're on Genesis 15, verse 1, part 2. And we're going to spend a little time here on this beautiful verse, uh, Genesis 15, 1. I'll just read it. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And we see here in Genesis 15, 1, that, hey, Abram just went through a whole lot of turmoil, a whole lot of turbulence, amen. He'd just gone through a battle to, to get his nephew Lot back, uh, to restore Sodom, to uh, defeat these invaders, amen. Uh, him and his 300 or so trained servants, amen. It's incredible what God can do with just a small group. Amen. Uh, and it's incredible how little really we have about this, uh, battle, right? Um, verse 14 of Genesis 14. And when Abram had heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318 and pursued them unto Dan. Verse 15, he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Verse 16, and he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, his goods, and the women also, and the people. And that's it. That's kind of like what we have, the account of the battle. So while we don't have a lot of details, it does say that he smote them, right? And he brought back everything. He smote them all. He brought back everything. You know, as far as we can tell, he wiped them out, you know, and that in, in verse 20, Melchizedek here, a picture of Jesus says, blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. King of Sodom wants to give him things, but he won't take it because he said, you cannot, I'm not going to have God say that the king of Sodom or, or anyone made me rich, but God. Uh, and so look, anyone would be shook up. He was shook up, I'm sure. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not. So we see God is love, loving and kind. He knows Abram's state. He knows Abram shook up. He's not going to wait for like something else to happen. He's just going to present himself in a vision, saying, Look, don't be afraid. And he's going to give him these promises. I am a shield, and I am a great reward. Okay? But before we get to that, we notice the I am. So I am thy shield, right? God is speaking personally to Abram. You know, if I tell my son, my son's afraid, we're going to go um, on a nature walk and the trail looks unfamiliar. And I look at my son, I tell my son, son, don't be afraid. I'm going to take care of you. We'll be okay. Now I'm his father and I'm speaking to him personally, not a group of people, not corporately, not generally. I'm addressing my son personally, letting him know I'm going to take care of it, right? God is addressing Abram. His son personally saying, hey, I've got you. I'm going to take care of you. And we look at this and say, well, Abram was special. Hey, you're special to God. And God wants to have a relationship with you. And we're going to take a break and look deeper into this idea of that personal relationship with God coming about by living in his will. Stay tuned. You're listening to KJV Cafe. We encourage you to look us up on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Now let's get back to some more in-depth Bible study. So let's demystify a little bit. I mean, what does it mean to live in the will of God? What does that mean anyways? I mean, people are looking for some great proclamation from God of how they should live. Just look in your Bible and you'll find much truth about how to live in the will of God. We understand living in the will of God helps us become close to God and we can have fellowship with God, just like Abram had fellowship with God there in Genesis 15.1. So living in the will of God, what is living in the will of God? Living upright, that means without sin, the best that we can. Uh, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God, thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness, that's Psalm 143.10. David's asking God, teach me your will. You're my God, that's a personal God. Your spirit is good, lead me into the land of uprightness. 
How about renew your mind and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the will of God, we ask, David asked, Lord, teach me the will of God to live in the land of uprightness. The will of God, teach me to do what's good and acceptable and perfect in your will, right? Romans 12, 2. And that's not being conformed to this world, renewing our mind. Guys, if you think being carnal, if you think living in this world has anything to do with pleasing God, you are sorely mistaken. Serving Christ, another part of being in the will of God. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, Ephesians 6, 6. Doing the will of God from the heart is serving Christ, but not with eye service, not doing things like looking busy, right? If you're a kid and your mom tells you to clean up the room and she leaves for a season and then she comes back and when she comes back, all of a sudden you get up and you're like putting random things away, right? Are you really doing what you were supposed to do as a servant uh, to your parent? No, you're just simply doing something for eye service, right? Many people darken the doors of a church, come in there with a suit, come in there in their Sunday best, come in there with a prayer request, come in there and shaking hands and telling people they love them. And they are so far from God. They are not doing the will of God. They are not servants of Christ. You know, oh, look at when Jesus calls people to follow him, the excuses they bring. Oh, I have to go bury my relative. I have to, I just got married. I, I have to go check on this land, whatever it is. You know, people today, they think, they, they think that Christ would be okay with those things, right? They're lowering the standard. There's a couple more, and then I'm going to get to the underpinning issue here. Increasing in knowledge of God and being fruitful in the ministry. It's another part of the will of God. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's Colossians 1, 9 through 10, increasing in knowledge of God. And that, by the way, is a byproduct of being, or fruit, being fruitful in the ministry is a byproduct of increasing in knowledge of God. If we increase in the knowledge of God, we'll be fruitful. You don't have to think of like some ministry you could do for God. Just increase in the knowledge of him and he'll put it on your heart. Ministry in general, serving Christ in general, Lord, help me to say this correctly, would be spending a lot of time with God. And that's it. You have a morning Bible study. You have an evening Bible study. You have an afternoon prayer. You have Sunday morning service, Sunday night service, Wednesday night service. You have work you do in the ministry Saturday, whatever it is. You spend time with God focused on his word and his way and his will. Yes, with a full-time job. Yes, being a full-time student. Yes, being a parent. Yes, whatever else. You, you spend time with God. And he will put on your heart an abundance of things that you can do to serve him. I mean, the disciples didn't lack for things to do, right? They had forsaken all. They were living for God. They had plenty to do. Paul didn't lack. Amen. Look at, go in the book of Acts and look at all of the missionary travels of Paul, all the great tribulations he faced. And yet he stayed busy for God, sometimes years at a time in one place, serving God. That all comes from spending time with God. Amen. These two are inseparable. You cannot... Just decide that you're not going to spend any time with God and then think that he is going to bless and use you. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That's 1 Thessalonians 4.3. I'm going to assume you know what fornication means, but why don't we just say sin in general? For this is the will of God, even for your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication or sin. Paul's writing here, the will of God is not for you to sin. If you are flirting with sin, you are not living in the will of God. And I say that lovingly. I say that as someone that needs this advice myself to depart from anything sinful. Amen. Because we're all prone to sin. And yet you'll have some of these churches, these false doctrines out there telling you it's okay. And God understands live like you would. No, it's not okay. And God wouldn't understand because his word says clearly what we are to do. Psalm 119.11, I love this. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You see the correlation? God's word, don't sin. God's word, hide it in the heart, the deepest part of you, don't sin. How do we stop sinning against God? We store up his word in our hearts. 
And before I go any further, I want to underscore here, we talked about not sinning, serving the Lord, living upright, renewing our mind. Why do people not exercise judgment on this? Why do people not engage in this? Why is it so rare to find someone truly sold out to God? Here it is. One word, unbelief. Unbelief. This is all predicated on someone that actually believes God is who he says he is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, to paraphrase Hebrews eleven six, It's unbelief. People don't really believe God is who he is. They don't believe he's near. If they really thought he was so close, they wouldn't do the things that they're doing or say the things that they're saying. You know, we are to bring everything to God in prayer. We are to pray without ceasing. The idea the Bible speaks of bringing every thought in subjection to Christ. We are to believe the word through and through as true and true. Amen. And yet you got people walking around living as carnal as can be that want to advertise their Christianity. They want everyone to know that they're a Christian and yet they don't believe because they just, they just literally don't fear God. So God has this thing called faith and this thing called faith comes what by getting in his word, by the way, that's why my entire ministry is devoted to his word because that's where faith comes from. Right? So you have this thing called faith. And that faith, then when you live that out, shows what? A fear and reverence for God, right? And so when you have people living the inverse, they are not operating in faith. They don't fear or reverence God. And they are living a a false, uh, I don't know what, a false faith, I guess it would be called. They're living for maybe the little G God of this earth. You know, I've heard it said that you may be surprised who's in heaven and who's not. You know, and I would, I would buy into that, that there are people that we're, you know, we'll see as believers in heaven that we'll say, wow, I didn't know they'd be here. And there are people that we're like, we're so-and-so and they're not there. Why? Faith. Amen. A fear of God, believing he is who he says he is. And if people don't truly believe in God, by the way, there's so many ways to, to, to put this and I'll give you one. This is a clue. Okay. Watch for the, the phrase world view. Often unbelievers will use the phrase worldview. That's not my worldview. So I want to hedge my bets. I want to practice, you know, religiosity. I want these things. But my worldview isn't to believe, you know, the Bible is the true word of God. Isn't to believe that sin should be departed from. Isn't to believe that I should live a separate life. Isn't to believe that God is real and near. Isn't to believe that I won't be judged for every idle word I speak. Amen? Amen. Worldview, worldview. Watch out for that phrase. It is a very, very just telling sign that somebody doesn't believe. Now, again, they may say, I'm nuts. This fundamental nutcase over here with a latte. Okay. And you know what? They have a right to their opinion. Amen. But I'm going to believe. What What does the Bible say? By the foolishness of preaching. Amen. That's how God has ordained this. God has ordained having faith in him to look awfully foolish to the world. Well, think about that. If we're living in the world, if we're tempted and flirting with the world, then how do we look to God? Do we not look foolish? Amen. Man, you get into Proverbs, you read about the fool, you know, in common day uh, language, vernacular, nomenclature, the word fool is no big deal. In the Bible, the word fool is a severe word. It is like a, it is a very, very, look that up, you know, Bible word fool, that goes deep. It is very deep. It is not a good term to be associated with. And yet we have many living quite foolish today, thinking they know the true God, having absolutely no idea who he is, having no fellowship with him because they can't find time to seek him. I mean, people can camp out overnight to go see a concert. Amen. They can stand in line for hours to go to dinner. Trust me, I know. I used to live near New York City. Amen. And that place, people, I mean, it's nothing to wait in line an hour or two to go to dinner. People can wait for this and that and everything else, but they can't find time to dust off that Bible. They can't find time to go to church. Guess what? Guess how God would respond to that? I don't have to answer that. You know. But we see that when we are in the will of God, as Abram was now in the will of God, living for God, following him by faith, God is doing mighty things with him and through him. We see a closeness and a promise from God. Tune in next time as we get deeper into Genesis 15.1. Thank you for listening. Take care. God bless and amen. Thanks for spending time with us today at the cafe. We would love to hear from you. You can email Brother Clark directly at clark at enduringpromise.org. See you again tomorrow. 
Same time, same place.